Hello, I am Raymond Perrier, the director of the Dennis Hurley Centre, and it's my honour every year in February to present a review of our activities from the previous year. The last 12 months, of course, have been a, a period in which time has taken on a whole new perspective, sometimes moving incredibly fast, sometimes incredibly slowly. And it's good to remember that all of time is held in God's hands. Indeed, the mystery of time is something that the book of Ecclesiastes reflected on two and a half thousand years ago in these famous words. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. So if we think back just 12 months to our stakeholders meeting in February 2020, that seems so long ago now it was still a time to embrace, as shown here in a photo with Bishop Reuben Philip, Cardinal Wilfred Napier, and Dr. William Keyes, engaged in a close, maskless embrace of the sort we would never imagine now. Of course, Dr. Zwelli, as South African Minister of Health, had an extraordinary year ahead of him, an extraordinary year for all of us. Back then, Corona was just a beer brand, he was a homeless guy who presciently recognised the word which would take over our lives in 2020. Many words alongside pandemic and quarantine, self-isolate and of course Zoom, because this has become a time to refrain from embracing. And we do so because we're aware of the many people whose lives have been threatened by this virus. So let's begin by remembering those who've been taken from us in this past year. This is a time to mourn. We mourn new friends like Archbishop Coadjutor Abel Gabusa, taken from us before he was really able to make an impact. And old friends like Monsignor Paul Nadal, who at 88 had been a long-standing friend of Dennis Hurley, of the Dennis Hurley Centre, a trustee, a patron and a fundraiser. It's a time to mourn Virushka Ganga, a member of the original Face to Face Cafe team, and Pinkim Charlie, the music director at Emmanuel Cathedral next door. All four of these were taken from us by COVID, along with many hundreds of others around the world. So this is a time to mourn, to give thanks to God for their lives, and to ask for God's comfort for those who miss them and feel the pain of their loss. I hope, though, that there's also some happy moments in this last year, some times to celebrate. We certainly celebrated a year ago on Valentine's Day, when hundreds of us were gathered at the Durban Jewish Club for a jazzy afternoon to celebrate Paul Nadal's 60 years as a priest. We were able to celebrate some of our homeless men and women as their portraits were displayed at the Durban Art Gallery as part of a major exhibition. And through the year, we tried, insofar as we could, to celebrate the high days and holidays, here an attempt at a traditional Christmas lunch, albeit with masks and distancing. The pandemic and the lockdown, of course, dominated our lives over the last year. And we began in March with a time to organise, and the, the, the president didn't give us much time to organise, only four days to arrange emergency shelters for homeless people in central Durban. But thanks to a unique partnership with other NGOs and with the municipality, we were able to move into action. We helped organise a mass screening of homeless people, almost 2,000 people, at the Durban Exhibition Centre. We made sure that people were identified and triaged and allocated to the right kind of shelters that would suit them. And everyone stepped in and did whatever was necessary deliver on our promises. We were in fact able to set up shelters for 1,500 people in just four days in central Durban. And by doing so, we were able to protect people. In fact, Durban's response to accommodating the homeless during lockdown was the best in the country. The Dennis Hurley Centre itself was front and centre in responding to that. And we took on the duty of sheltering 100 sick, elderly and disabled homeless men who moved into our building in the end for almost four months. 
Of course, it was a strange home, but people really did feel at home. We also were involved in coordinating and designing the other parts of the emergency response and providing management to one of the shelters, the Jewish Club shelter here, where our friend Bongani Madida acted as a site manager. We advocated for the use of a municipal building to be the women's shelter, a building we had been campaigning for for many years. It ended up opening as the women's shelter for the emergency and thankfully has continued as a women's shelter run by Etiquini after the end of the lockdown. And in a similar way, some, though not all, of the tents that were set up have continued to provide safe open sleeping spaces for homeless men. And that means that instead of them trying to hide in door fronts or find a safe place among the dunes, they now have somewhere to, say, to sleep which is dry and which is legal. So some good came out of this crisis, and in some ways the homeless of Durban have ended up in a better position than they were before lockdown. And part of that is because we've seen a really positive shift in the attitudes of municipal officials and particularly of the police who now treat the homeless as people to be protected rather than people to be harassed, at least most of the time. With all those homeless people across the shelters, we obviously needed time to prepare food. And the response to this was a perfect Durban response. We had Christian NGOs making breakfast, a Hindu hotel providing lunch, Muslim community organizations delivering supper, and the Jewish club offering refreshments to all the workers. The Dennis Hurley Center kitchen itself was part of that feeding program. And last year we served 170,000 meals out of our kitchen, an increase of 70% on the previous year. The food was prepared but also by other organizations, for example, by community groups, or by different churches. Here you see the kitchen at Glenridge Church. Or by corporates. Here is the kitchen at the Pavilion Hotel on the beachfront that provided food for a number of months. And also smaller NGOs came to the party and it was good to be able to channel funds and goods towards them as part of the general COVID appeal that we coordinated on behalf of a range of NGOs. This feeding was all possible because of the fantastic model of collaboration and coordination that was led by Linda Morrison of We Are Durban, bringing together all the different parties who wanted to feed, corporates, NGOs and municipal departments and coordinating the food for delivery at the different camps. We had time to prepare food and time to serve food, served in different places and prepared in different places. The Dennis Hurley Centre itself, we were serving three or sometimes four meals a day for the hundred residents that we had staying at the centre. And residents themselves helped in the kitchen alongside Athena and Nothlangla who moved into the building so that they could prepare food during that period. Different NGOs delivered food at the camps during the lockdown and some have continued to do so after the lockdown. During that period, Ramadan occurred and we were delighted that we were able to ensure that Muslims who were staying in the camps were able to observe Ramadan by receiving food at the time they needed. And Easter also occurred, so we made sure that chocolate could be distributed to all the residents. Once the hard lockdown was over, we went back to serving at the Dennis Hurley Centre to everyone who turned up at our gate. Sometimes we've been serving the food on site, but outside. But more often we've been serving as takeaways so that people aren't congregating at our building. That's been possible because we decided to invest in eco containers at a cost of a thousand rand a day. We've made sure that we're not contributing to the mountain of plastic waste that builds up in our city every day. So we were able to protect people, but also do our bit to protect the planet. And we've collaborated with other churches to make all this possible, with other churches who wanted to prepare food but couldn't distribute it and so could deliver it to the Dennis Hurley Centre for distribution, and with churches such as this church on the point, which wanted to distribute food 
but couldn't access it. So we acted as a clearinghouse, bringing together sources of food and churches that were in need of food. Lockdown provided a curious period of calmness, and so it became a time to make friends. One great example of this is Rasta, Sandila M. Keys, assistant to Bongani at the Jewish Club Centre, who then went on to be a great homeless gardener and a famous figure on TV. At the centre itself, our motley crew of 100 sick, disabled and elderly residents became people that we got to know and to love. And we were thus able to understand their background, understand their family situation and make sure that each one was rehoused safely when we closed down the residential centre. Covid, of course, was a health problem, so this was a time to heal, not just dealing with Covid, but the myriad of health problems that affect the poor in central Durban. From day one of the lockdown, our mobile clinic was visiting all the emergency shelters, in particular making sure that people could continue on their TB medications and on their ARV treatments. Sadly, it took City Health five weeks before they moved into action. And so as a result of that, we saw 14,000 patients during the course of 2020, both through our community outreach and at the Dennis Hurley Centre itself. That number, in fact, is a drop from previous years because it was so much harder to see patients and we had to keep changing our way of delivery with different levels of lockdown. We were assisted by volunteers, not just Dr Stephen Carpenter, who regularly volunteers with us, but other doctors, psychologists and psychiatrists. And we were also helped by services from other NGOs. Here, for example, Match used their mobile X-ray unit to conduct X-ray screening of all of the homeless across all of the camps. We were able to identify people who needed TB medication and get them through a six month TB medication program, something we'd often not been able to do with some of the homeless in the past. After the end of lockdown, we've continued to provide health care to the different emergency shelters, as well as providing it at the Dennis Hurley Centre for homeless people and refugees who drop into our clinic. We're interested not just in physical healing, but of course spiritual healing, and the lockdown gave plenty of time to pray. Going back to the period before the lockdown, we remember the Hurley Memorial Mass held in Emmanuel Cathedral and led by Archbishop Liam Slattery. We also remember the time when St Joseph's, St. Joseph's Church Morningside brought in their confirmation class to celebrate Mass in our kitchen and then to serve food from the same kitchen, the young people understanding the connection between the sacrifice of the Mass and the sacrifice of their own lives in serving the poor. And we were able to have a day of Lenten reflection for our staff led by Reverend Lauren Matthews, albeit all of us masked and suitably distanced at the St Thomas Garden. Once the lockdown began, it became a time to pray with the residents in the camps, and we initiated a team of chaplains to visit all the camps, Catholic priests of other Christian denominations, and indeed priests of all denominations and faiths visiting the homeless in the different camps. And those chaplains were there not just for the residents staying in the camps, but also all those serving, the police, the nurses, the government officials, who also needed spiritual help and support during this difficult time. In the middle of the hard lockdown, we of course had Easter and Holy Week. And for us, this was especially poignant because it gave us a chance to have what Father Sabello described as a pop-up monastery, a hundred residents, became monks, and Emmanuel Cathedral, their in-house chapel. So on Maundy Thursday, we could host a service, not with a washing of, of feet, but a washing of hands. And on Good Friday, the homeless could gather inside the cathedral and follow the traditional service of venerating the cross, sitting, kneeling, and standing before the dying Christ and praying to feel the pain that he suffered and to know that he feels our pain as well. An extraordinary sight of different men gathering around the cross. But as Christians, we believe that after death,
comes life. After Good Friday comes Easter Sunday. And Father Sabello was able to proclaim the risen Christ, liberation, freedom, life to the homeless men staying at the Dennis Hurley Center. It was a time to pray, but also a time to play. We needed to keep ourselves and other people entertained. Sadly, the singing classes organized by Okuza were among the first casualties of COVID. Those had to end early on in 2020. But we found simple ways of relaxing, taking our homeless residents down to the beachfront, or helping them to create games of their own. The municipality mobilized its immense resources to provide some entertainment to the camps. UKZN's occupational therapy students were working with us to provide art therapy to some of our residents. Other NGOs came in helping teach people a different crafts and also providing sports equipment. It's surprising what kind of games you see played in, a ref in, a, in an emergency camp. And some residents were creative enough to develop their own sports equipment. In different ways, we managed to keep ourselves entertained and keep each other smiling. It was also a time to read. Before lockdown, Mosina Jordan, a retired US ambassador and children's author, came to our Dalton creche and read stories to the young, young children and also taught their parents and encouraged their parents to read with them, donating some wonderful books. Making books accessible to everyone is a big part of our street lit program. And that continued during the lockdown, providing books, providing books for people to choose from so that they could read when they had nothing else to do. We also arranged for scriptures to be distributed here, for example, Bibles in both English and Zulu. And for newspapers to be delivered to the camps, courtesy of independent newspapers. That was just one of many gifts that helped during this period, and it would be impossible really to list all the people, organizations, and businesses who've donated goods and money in this past year. But let me highlight three examples. We had a great event when current members of the Shark rugby team and veteran members came together at one of the spa supermarkets and did a big food drive for us. And schools, even though they had so many other things to contend with, did not forget us. Here, Holy Family College brought together some of their young students to raise funds and buy food to help in our kitchen. And a wonderful example here where two people living in the building right next door to the Jewish club shelter came down one day not to complain, but rather to ask how they could help. And they returned a day later with a hundred portions of chicken and chips to serve to all the people in the camp. So a lot of good was done during this year, but there's still time for there's still room for improvement. And for that reason, it's always for us a time to speak out. Just before lockdown on Human Rights Day, we coordinated with the National Homeless Network a submission to the South African Human Rights Commission that they investigate the multiple violations of human rights that are perpetrated on the homeless by SAPs and Metro Police forces around the country. That story was covered in the media and throughout the year we've continued to use the media to make sure that the stories of the homeless and the refugees are heard by the general public. Here SABC are interviewing Bongani Madida outside our building. Or ENCA interviewing me during the screening sessions at the Durban Exhibition Centre. It's chilling to see the caption there that just two deaths had occurred from coronavirus at that time. And we've also campaigned that homeless people should access replacement IDs. We discovered half of those in the camp did not have IDs. We compiled a list of all of them. Sadly, after all these months, Home Affairs have actually only delivered IDs for about 10% of them. We've had great support from local media, English and Zulu language. So we've been able to celebrate the good things when they've happened, but also to point out the less good things. For example, the scandal of the city claiming they spent 68 million rand helping the homeless during the first 100 days. 
the equivalent, would you believe, of 450 rand per homeless person per day during that period, as much as it would have cost to put them all in a hotel room. And we continue to fight, in particular, the people of Bolton. We've been speaking out for them for the last five years. Part of that advocacy has led to the installation of ablution blocks, but you'll see that the sewerage and the, and the water distribution is still not working properly. And then again, only last week, the police moved in and started destroying people's belongings again. A story covered in the Mercury and also on TV and radio news. And we've been empowering the homeless to speak out for themselves. It was wonderful how many of them wanted to get involved in the Orange Mask campaign to speak out against COVID corruption. It's been for all of us a time to learn, learning whenever and however we can. Before lockdown, we were part of an event which brought together South African and American police officers to share their experiences of working with the homeless. And we work with the South African Depression and Anxiety Group to help homeless people to talk about some of the mental health issues that affect them. Early on in lockdown, we partnered with a number of organisations to promote a very simple uh, phone based system for distributing information about COVID in multiple languages. And during the lockdown, we ensured that people had access to the latest information and indeed even to the president's family meetings. Here a group who were staying at the YMCA homeless shelter. We were able to organize some trainings in our own building, of course, suitably distance. And we also hosted a pop-up school. We were able to provide them with a safe space to run their exams, and they provided some income for us. Ella Thompson, who runs our Street Lit program, benefited from a business coaching program courtesy of the Gordon Institute of Business Science and funded by the SAB Foundation. And we continued to give talks so that other people could learn about the plight of homeless people and refugees in Durban. Talks to church groups, rotary clubs, initially face to face, and then in the last few months, of course, online. And talking of online, we were able to host the National Homeless Conversation not in Durban as planned, but rather from Durban, bringing together 250 people around the country to learn about homelessness and ensuring that homeless people could access the conference from our computer room using Zoom. It was also a time to make money, although harder than as usual. That's of course important because when we did the survey of the homeless a few years ago, 72% of them said that the way that they could stop being homeless would if they had access to work. So our street lit vendors remained focused on making money and even during the hard lockdown found ways of selling books online. The lockdown also gave people a chance to clear out their attics and their spare rooms and we had great donations of books and time to sort out the stock at our great book storage facility at the St John's Ambulance Building. Some of our selling venues remained open such as this one at the Pick and Pay Hyper in Durban North. But sadly, many of them, like churches and theatres, were closed. And so we had to be creative in finding new venues to sell. Here, a nursery in Shalcross, where our seller is specialising in gardening books. And we're particularly pleased with the partnership with Catholics this year, which enabled us to fund and employ six young people to work in and around the Dennis Hurley Centre. And also to recruit scooter drivers to respond to the huge demand for food delivery that the lockdown has created. And another way of people making money was from growing things. We weren't responsible for the project, but we did help facilitate a group of young people, a group of homeless people who saw at the Jewish club not an piece of land, but instead the potential for a city farm. And they turned it into a wonderful spinach garden, which really caught the imagination of the media. And we helped them with marketing and selling and connecting them with a box of stores so they could sell their goods and make some money. So finally, here is an opportunity to give thanks to the many individuals and organisations who enable us to do what we do. 
just in the street lit project alone, we have so many people to say thank you to who help us by finding books, storing books and giving us venues where we can sell. We were able through the press to thank the many people who work together to collect and distribute funds to help a range of NGOs during the lockdown. And personal thank yous are also important. It was lovely that those staying at the Hurley Centre made a special point of using Mother's Day to say thank you to Mand Lobel and the other women who were helping them while they were staying there. It's not possible to say a personal thank you to all who've helped us. I hope this list covers everyone, and if names are missing, I do apologise, but here are some of the organisations, the faith partners, the arts partners, the educational partners, media partners, NGO partners, a long list of corporate partners and funding partners, and also the government partners and overseas partners who've helped us over the last year. We hope they will continue to help us as we move into 2021. We have no idea what the year has in store for us, but we hope that whatever it kicks in our direction will be ready to respond. And we're able to do so because of all the that we enjoy. Although you've been listening to my voice, one of the advantages of this online AGM is you can hear so many more voices. In fact, the videos on our YouTube channel, you can hear from over 70 different people talking about their relationship with the Dennis Hurley Center. People who use our service, staff members, donors, partners, NGOs, patrons, trustees, religious leaders some here in South Africa, some in the world. And we hope to continue to work with all of them and with you to make a difference to the lives of homeless people, refugees and the poor of central Durban. Thank you for listening.